now let's use the concepts of the reflection coefficient to calculate the amplitudes of voltages and currents as they are established on a transmission line due to reflections in the circuit. In this example, we have a 50 ohm lossless transmission line, which is connected to a battery having 30 ohms of internal resistance. The circuit's then terminated in a 200 ohm load. We're going to assume that the value of the first voltage wave is 40 volts, and then we want to determine the value of the first reflected voltage wave and the first reflected current wave. So I've taken this word problem here, and I've um, converted it over to a, a circuit diagram so that we can see what we're talking about. When it says 50 ohm lossless T-line, what it's telling us is that the transmission line has a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. So when they tell you what the impedance of a transmission line is, that is always referring to the characteristic impedance. 30 ohms is the internal um, resistance of the generator. You'll remember that the generators in most of our labs have uh, 50 ohms of internal resistance. So that's similar here. And then... Finally, we've got just a real load of uh, 200 ohms, so no capacitance, no inductance. There's going to be two points in the circuit in which a uh, reflection occurs. One, when the waves strike the impedance boundary between the transmission line and the load, and a second reflection could occur if um, reflected waves then are returned back to the source and strike this impedance boundary. So um, if you were to picture that, Let's draw a line here, and this line represents the impedance boundary between um, the source and the transmission line. And let's draw a second line, which represents the impedance boundary between the load and the transmission line. So those are f separated by some physical distance, which is the length of the transmission line. So what's happening is some voltage waveform leaves the transmission line input end at t equals zero seconds and it moves towards the load reaching it some t seconds later. At this point if a reflection occurs a reflected voltage wave is going to get launched back towards the source and so this wave is traveling from left to right this reflected wave is going to travel from right to left. When that wave reaches the impedance boundary here and this is also going to be t seconds because it's traveling the same distance, so this is 2t later. When that occurs, another reflection can occur depending on the reflection coefficient here. And if that is to occur, another wave gets launched back towards the source. And this process is just going to happen over and over and over and over. Actually, forever. It's never going to end. What it is true, though, is that the magnitudes of these reflected waves get smaller and smaller and smaller and therefore less and less significant to our mathematical calculations. But let's put some numbers behind this stuff. Let's first start by calculating the voltage reflection coefficients. And remember there's two of those. There's one at the load and one at the source. And the voltage reflection coefficient at the source is going to be equal to the impedance of the source minus the characteristic impedance of the transmission line over the sum of those same two numbers. And so that's 30 minus 50 ohms over 30 plus 50 ohms. Ohms cancel out and we're left with a minus 0 0.25 as the purely real reflection coefficient at the interface between the generator and the transmission line. And then we've got the reflection coefficient at the load, which is ZL minus the characteristic impedance of the T-line over the load impedance impedance plus the characteristic impedance of the T-line. So that's 200 minus 50 ohms over 200 plus 50 ohms. And that's going to give us a value of 0 0.6. We were told in the problem statement to assume that the first um, forward voltage wave VP1 is equal to 40 volts. What we need to do next is calculate the first forward current wave. And how we do that is we use the concept that Z0 is equal to V bar plus over I bar plus. Rearranging this equation leads to the first forward current wave magnitude 
can be calculated by taking the first forward voltage wave magnitude and simply dividing by the characteristic impedance. And so this is going to be 40 volts divided by 50 ohms, which gives us an amplitude of 0 0.8 amps. So the amplitude of I bar plus is 0 0.8 amps. We can now calculate the, so that's, if we're looking at this diagram, if this was a voltage diagram, that's going to be 40 volts. If this was a current diagram, that's going to be uh, 0.8 amps. What we want to now next calculate is the magnitude of this reflected signal. So we will call that the first reflected signal. And we use the reflection coefficient to calculate that. So it's going to be VP1. So V. Um, the value of the reflected voltage, call it V reflected one, is just equal to VP1 times the reflection coefficient at the load. And so that's going to be equal to 40 volts times 0.6. I left out the decimal there. Excuse me. And so that's going to give us a value of 24 volts. So this guy coming this direction has a value of 24 volts. So that's the first reflected voltage wave. The first reflected current wave, IR1, uh, is going to be equal to the um, first forward current wave times minus the reflection coefficient at the load. So that's 0 0.8 times minus 0.6. And that's minus 0.48 amps. So that's the value of the first reflected um, current wave. So what's going to happen is that these signals are going to continue to bounce back and forth, and we could just keep calculating their values, and I'll do that real fast. The second forward voltage wave is going to be 24 volts times the reflection coefficient at the source, which is minus 0.25, so that's minus 6 volts. And then the second reverse voltage waveform is going to be that minus 6 volts times the reflection coefficient at the load, which is 0.6. So that's minus 3.6. What I'm trying to show here is that we started with 40 volts, the reflection was then 24 volts, the um, next reflection was minus 6 volts and then minus 3.6 volts. It's getting smaller and smaller, and this behavior will continue. If we were to repeat the analysis for current, we would take this um, minus 0.48 amps, 0.48 amps. We would multiply it by the reflection coefficient uh, at the source. That's the voltage reflection coefficient, so we take the opposite of that for the current reflection. And that gives us minus 0.12 amps. And then if we were looking at the second reverse current wave, we would take that minus 0.12 amps, and we would multiply it by the reflection coefficient at the load, which for current would be minus 0.6. And so that gives us 0 0.072 amps. Again, 0.8 amps, minus 0.48, minus 0.12, 0 0.072. And um, usually the question I get right here is, well, what does that mean, minus voltages, and uh, when I'm talking about an AC s s uh, signal? And what that means is that at the, if the incident wave has this phase, the reflected wave is going to be, excuse me, that's an incorrect term, the reflected wave is going to be 180 degrees out of phase. So that minus sign just indicates that we flipped the phase, or we have 180 degrees of phase shift is what that minus sign indicates to us, phase change.